Hello, this is Dr. Jack McGeechee, YouTube's addiction medicine physician. Welcome back to the channel. Today, I'd like to talk about the seven things that every Suboxone patient needs. Before I get started, I need to remind you that nothing we speak about today should be considered medical advice. If you have a question about addiction treatment, consult with a licensed professional before starting any course of treatment. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's begin. Number one on my list is Miralax. Really starting with a bang with this one, you could say. Suboxone, when it's taken appropriately, is a life-saving drug. However, like all prescription opioids, it does have side effects, chief among them constipation. Opioids cause constipation by slowing the movement of digested food through the GI tract. This allows the colon more time to extract water from the stool making it harder and slower to pass. Lifestyle modifications are always the first recommendation for the treatment of constipation. There are three chief lifestyle modifications that are recommended. Increasing dietary fiber, ensuring adequate hydration, and regular exercise. However, for a person taking prescription opioids such as Suboxone, this may not be enough. Enter Miralax. It's a colorless, odorless, and tasteless powder that readily dissolves in the liquid of your choice. If taken on a daily basis, it helps soften stools by increasing the amount of retained moisture within the stools, thus making them easier to pass. Miralax may not help all people, and if you continue to experience persistent constipation, you should consult with a physician as you may need referral to a specialist like a GI doctor to screen for anatomical causes of constipation, especially colorectal cancer. There are also other pharmacologic options for treatment nowadays. Ask your doctor before starting any course of treatment. Number two on my must-have list is naloxone or Narcan nasal spray. It is the antidote for opioid overdose, and when used for this purpose, it is life-saving. All people prescribed opioids, including Suboxone, should have Narcan nasal spray. It is available over the counter without a prescription in all 50 states. If you don't want to pay out of pocket, however, you can ask for a prescription from your doctor or seek out a supply from a harm reduction program. Even if you don't think that you are going to overdose personally, you should have Narcan available. You may be called upon to use it in the event that a friend or family member overdoses. It's important to let your family and friends know that you have Narcan available, where they can find that Narcan, and how to use it in the event of an emergency. Number three on my must-have list is a close friend. Unlike some other items on this list, this is not an object, but rather a person. Addiction is a disease that's largely characterized by social isolation and withdrawal. Therefore, it's helpful to have at least one close friend or family member who's invested in your recovery. This social support has many benefits. They can help keep you accountable and make sure that you keep your appointments. They can safeguard your medications if you're concerned that you can't be responsible for them. They can watch you when you're going through the worst of withdrawal and keep an eye on you. And they can also provide material support, such as driving you to your appointments or cooking for you when you just don't feel like you're able to. More importantly, this social support provides you a sympathetic ear and a shoulder to cry on. There may be some things that you're not comfortable speaking about with a medical professional, but that you would feel comfortable discussing with a close friend or family member. Therefore, whoever you choose for this role should be someone that you are completely comfortable being 100% honest with. The ultimate goal of recovery from addiction is reintegration with the community. The people who provide you social support can provide a safe space for you to practice the skills and behaviors that you learn in therapy that will help you achieve this reintegration. Now, 
In a perfect world, every person recovering from substance use disorder would also have the support of at least one person who's been there themselves. If you do have access to a person you trust who has recovered from addiction themselves, their support can be a tremendous asset in your own recovery. However, don't think that this is a requirement. Your social support can be anybody that you fully trust. Item number four on my list is a trusted medical professional. Again, this is not an object, but rather a person. Every person taking Suboxone should have a trusted medical professional on their team. This could be the doctor prescribing your Suboxone, but it could also be a therapist, counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, or social worker. This person can help you navigate the healthcare setting, which is difficult even in the best of times, even if you're not battling addiction. They can also provide you counseling and therapy that teaches you the skills you need in order to sustain your recovery in the real world outside the clinic or treatment center. Additionally, many people who are taking Suboxone have chronic or acute medical conditions that are related to their prior drug use. A physician can screen, diagnose, and treat these issues. For these reasons and more, every person on Suboxone should have a trusted medical professional. Number five, a reliable pharmacy. Taking Suboxone is easy, right? You take the prescription from your doctor and you fill it at the pharmacy. End of story. If only it was that simple. Unfortunately, many patients run into issues when it comes to filling their Suboxone prescription from the pharmacy. They may be told that the pharmacy does not have enough medication in stock to fill their prescription. If they call the pharmacies, the pharmacy is going to refuse to disclose over the phone whether or not they have it in stock. And if they travel to multiple pharmacies in order to seek a prescription fill, they may be flagged as a drug seeker. It's all terribly unfair and unjust. The reason for this is that the DEA sets very tight limitations on the amount of controlled substances that each pharmacy can order. Each individual pharmacy has a limited supply of medication that they have to allot among their existing patients. For established patients, they don't typically run into issues with refills. However, for a patient who is newly started on Suboxone, it may be difficult to find a pharmacy that has medication on hand to fill their initial prescription. The takeaway is that once a patient establishes with a pharmacy, they should stick with that particular pharmacy for all their refills. Pharmacies don't like transferring these prescriptions either because the DEA very closely regulates transfers of controlled substance prescriptions. Therefore, it's important to find a pharmacy that is reliable, trustworthy, and treats you right. There's a number of ways to do this. The best way is to take your doctor's advice when they recommend a pharmacy. Your physician does this day in and day out, and they interact with many different pharmacies. They know which local pharmacies treat their patients properly and which ones disrespect their patients or create unnecessary barriers to filling their prescriptions. Another source of information are other patients who are taking Suboxone. They have personal experience with pharmacies and can tell you which ones are more eager to work with you and which ones to avoid. Once you find a good pharmacy, stick with it and try to get your medication refilled there each time. If you need to go on vacation, it really is best to time it such that you don't have to obtain a refill at a pharmacy that is out of state or in a different city, as this may create problems. If you're moving, you should establish well in advance the pharmacy that you plan to transfer your prescriptions to and give your existing pharmacy plenty of notice. Once you find a trusted pharmacy, it can be a great partner. However, you do need to do a little bit of legwork. Number six, a journal. Journaling is an excellent tool for self-discovery. Addiction treatment involves addressing not only the outward social issues, but also the inner maladaptive thoughts 
in emotions that drive addictive behaviors. Journaling is a process by which a person records the events of their day and their emotional reaction to them. This can help people better understand their emotions and also identify patterns of behavior that they were previously unaware of. A journal can also help identify triggers to use. Every time a person feels compelled to use their substance of choice, they make a brief journal entry. And this accomplishes two things. Number one, it helps them identify their triggers and therefore avoid them. And number two, perhaps more importantly, the very act of journaling interrupts the automatic thoughts that lead to the compulsion to use. The act of getting up, finding the journal, making an entry by putting pen to paper puts you in a different environment and therefore changes your brain's thoughts. I recommend keeping a paper journal rather than an electronic log. There's something to the art of handwriting that activates your brain in a way that's different than typing. A physical journal also serves as a tangible document that shows your progress through recovery and that can be very motivating. Finally, a paper journal is perhaps the most secure method to store your data, provided that you safeguard the journal. If you have issues with handwriting, keeping an electronic log on your phone or computer is acceptable. Alternatively, if you're not much of a typist, you could get a voice recorder to journal your thoughts and emotions. Regardless of the form your journal takes, be sure to bring it with you to any doctor's appointments. That way, it can serve as a reference for any observations that you've made and also can help you uh, springboard any discussions with your doctor. Item number seven on my list is a meal plan. The prolonged use of drugs and alcohol depletes the body of both macro and micronutrients. This means that for the person in recovery, they have a greater need for nutrition than the average person. The best source of both macro and micronutrients is the diet rather than supplement pills. The best way to ensure somebody eats a healthy and varied diet is meal planning. Now, there are many resources available online that describe how you can create and execute a meal plan. That said, many people in recovery are very busy with other aspects of their life, and therefore they might benefit from paying a commercial service to deliver meals to them. Like today's sponsor, I got you there. <laughs> I don't have any sponsors, but if you're listening, call me HelloFresh. That aside, a uh, meal plan can be very helpful to somebody who is in recovery. And therefore, I think that every person taking Suboxone should have a meal plan. So that's it. That's the seven things that I think every person taking Suboxone should have. Do you think I missed something? Leave it in the comments below. If I get enough suggestions, I might make another video. If you enjoyed the video today, click the like button below. If you think that I earned it, click subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Finally, if you or somebody that you love is suffering from problematic drug or alcohol use and is interested in seeking treatment, please visit my website, ntehealth.com. Our phone number is on the website, but you can also contact us through the submit button in order to schedule a discovery call where we can discuss treatment options. At this time, treatment is limited to residents of the state of Florida. Thank you, it's been a pleasure and I appreciate you watching to the end of the video. Till next time, bye-bye.